Welcome to the Dialogue Series, Dancing in the Liminal, a global border-crossing inquiry into art, activism, spirituality, and leadership for the 21st century. I'm your Dialogue hostess, Vanessa Fisher, and I'm here with my seventh guest on this series, Michaela Bohm. Michaela is also the third and final guest of a special trilogy series I've been hosting here on my website entitled Holy Irreverence, Exploring the Dark Side of the Sacred, and you can read an important overview and framing for this series by following the links on this page. Born and raised in Austria, Michaela received two degrees in psychology from the University of Vienna and received further extensive training in cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnosis, NLP, and yoga. And thus, Michaela brings a holistic approach to her work with both individuals and couples, as well as to her women and co-ed workshops. On a more personal note, Michaela has been a very sweet presence in my life over the last couple of years, as I found her to be one of the most grounded and empowered women that I know. She holds a deep and rare capacity to move people through the complex energetic terrain of sexuality and intimacy with wisdom, compassion, and depth of insight. Therefore, it seemed very natural for me to have Michaela here as my guest for exploring the last installment of my trilogy series, The Dark Side of Eroticism, Exploring Sex, Death, and the Polarity of Intimacy. So welcome, Michaela. Great to have you here. Well, I'm happy we got to connect today. Me too. Me too. I'd love to start, I think our audience would love to know a bit about your history just briefly and love to just hear a bit about your background and why you got into the work with sexuality and intimacy and relationships, if you wanted to share some context of what drew you to that area for your life work. Sure. I started out just wanting to be a therapist. You know, there weren't that many paths to choose from when I received my education. I lived in Austria, so things are much more precise and in little boxes so I started out wanting to be a therapist and trained to be a therapist but realized pretty quickly that classical therapy wasn't where my passion was and so having studied Jungian psychology amongst other things I started going more into shadow aspects and also patterning particularly patterning as it occurs as people develop so developmental Mm -hmm. patterning also evolutionary patterning and so in the realm of feeling what's beyond therapy and what moves people outside of the therapeutic model, I kind of realized pretty quickly that sexuality and everything that came with sexuality was the area where people really had the most trouble and the most hang-ups. And uh, Mm. subsequently realized that most relationships break up not because the love is missing, but because the sexual polarity is missing. And everything that comes with it, people cheating, people having very kinked underlying tendencies that are not addressed. So I started going into the sexual realms of things pretty early on. I also have an education in the realm of forensics. So what makes people tick and what makes people be kinked in a certain way was always of great fascination to me. In addition to that, I started studying with a woman once I moved to Germany when I was 21. When I moved to Germany, I studied with a woman whose expertise was also in the sexual realm. And in the course of my 20s, essentially, it it synthesized into an offering that was more yogic than therapeutic. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And when you said, I was just curious because you said that you noticed that the biggest kinks were around sexuality. Did you notice that that impacted, you know, we could talk about eros or the erotic on a pretty broad scale, Mm -hmm. like the spectrum of erotic energy, all the way from sexuality to creativity and different levels of that. Did you find that if something was kinked in the sexual, did you find that it affected other levels of people's lives, like how the erotic expressed itself at other levels? Is that something that you noticed at all? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I think that how we relate to sex 
informs every aspect of our lives and when i'm saying sex i'm not talking actual you know physical intercourse so much as the interplay of consciousness and light or masculine or feminine or light and dark however you want to call it Mm -hmm. the two poles and how they express themselves and because of the way human beings are built energetically the lower regions of the body the lower chakras of the body whatever you want to call it you know different people have different belief systems around that but the actual lower parts of the body are deeply connected with money or deeply connected with you know food with Mm -hmm. power with creative ability so if things are kinked from the waist down energetically as well as psychologically and pattern wise that most definitely influences how a human being shows up in the world and I think for me you know when I started teaching well first assisting and then teaching with David Data one of the most striking things to me was how clearly energetically connected these things were not only sexually but in people's lives and how people's lives would be so Mm. deeply impacted by their hang-ups around sex and darkness and death and money and food and these kind of things. I'm curious if you saw that particularly in quote-unquote spiritual people because there's sort of a tendency to be transcendent in spiritual communities sometimes in a way that might negate some of those lower chakra <laughs> energies. <laughs> well, <curious> you... <laughs> don't get me started. It's <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely say that people who consider themselves spiritual practitioners are yeah. more impacted by these things than yeah. people who are not and that's always striking to me and I've particularly in the last few years really started to understand the depth of who somebody is as a human being has very little to do with what they practice you know and and I have great respect these days for people who do very little spiritual practice but are deeply heart open and body open in the world in ways that are just beautiful and so yes I would definitely say if you're trying to just elevate your consciousness without taking the dark sides along the shadows along however you want to call it you are definitely becoming a less full and integrated human being and more and more so and it seems to I mean my experience is there's a loss of intimacy a loss of intimacy with all the ways that we interact with life and each other and if there's an attempt to transcend or surpass these areas of our lives that actually impacts the capacity we have for deep intimacy. That's been my experience. Yes, I would agree with you. I'm a hundred percent. I think that the separating out and only focusing on the light and only focusing on the positive and, you know, I don't always mean it quite that black and white, just painting a picture, but, yeah. you know, painting that picture, I would definitely say that when you are constantly focusing on that which you consider light and positive and the manifestation of things, Mm -hmm. you are separating from a whole big aspect of life which isn't pretty, which isn't light, which is messy and dirty and sad and disgusting and, you know, many other things. But that's also what makes it interesting and that's also what makes it full. And so, yes, I think there's a huge spiritual bypass for lots of people. It seems very prevalent. Like, I'm just partly why I left the spiritual scene. Like, I really made a conscious choice to leave and just go to another country because I felt just that there was so much of that going on that I saw. And and also just needing to descend into Mm -hmm. myself more on those Mm -hmm. realms. So I just very much resonate with that. And I just also actually should set a little bit of context in these dialogues for what I mean by the dark side, because there's so many connotations that people make about the dark. So, you know, when I talk about the dark side, there's a few different things I'm trying to unpack. One is I've been very attracted to this notion of the liminal. I've Mm. been really drawn to this idea of liminal space. And it's kind of that in-between space of infinite potential, the dark pregnant mystery of unknowing. Also, I've experienced it as a place of in-between space that offers healing and transformation, the potential Mm -hmm. for a lot of healing and transformation and integration of seeming opposites or polarities. And at the same time, I'm also referring, like we've been talking about the dark side as just all of those pieces of our individual psyche and our collective psyche that we don't really want to look at, that are painful, that are hard, that are dirty, that are chaotic, that 
tend to get pushed out of conscious awareness, both in culture and individuals. Mm -hmm. And so I've found a lot of energy in exploring those pieces. And yet, as we both know, it can also be dangerous. You have to kind of know what you're doing. You also have to have a certain amount of stable egoic structure to be able to integrate darker energies. And so within that, this conversation specifically about the nature of the erotic impulse and the dark side of the erotic. So maybe want to share a little bit about how you relate to eros, the erotic, the dark side of the erotic as it shows up in your own life and in your work with people. And just if you want to go a little more in depth. I would say both in my teaching work and in my work with individuals and couples, one of the first things that I start to feel when I work with people is their relationship with their own erotic or their own sexuality and how that influences their relationship with the world. So for me personally, what's most important is how dark and how light somebody can go. And I personally believe that you can only go as light as you can go dark, meaning you have to embrace both ends of the spectrum fully or and it's not happening yeah. as deeply as it could. Yeah, I was just going to say there's a sense, just I've noticed with certain people I feel work with holding a lot of light but don't descend, that there's almost a stiff quality to it, almost a kind of stiffness to upholding the higher realms but not wanting to go below. You're not as flexible. Yes, you pretty much have to become somewhat rigid and very controlled to keep things in check yeah. because as we both know, life is pretty messy and things can happen at any given moment. So if you're making the decision to just play in the lighter realms of existence, you are having to work harder. And you'll probably notice this, and I notice this for myself, that when I'm trying to hold certain things at bay, I become a lot more tired and a lot more zapped of energy simply because you're working against nature in a certain way. And there's whole spiritual practices that people do that are pretty much geared towards not wanting to feel the darker aspects or the spaces in between spaces or whatever you want to call it. So when that happens, there's a certain, like you said, there's a rigidity, there is an unwillingness to be with what is. There's usually blocks in the body. My work's very body-centered and everything I teach is experiential and in exercises. So what I look at is how close to somebody's solar plexus, how lifeless is the lower parts of their body. What happens when they breathe? Are they breathing in their chest? Are they breathing in their belly? Are they breathing at all? How are they breathing? How are they moving? How is the body moving when they speak? And so based on that, my first entry point into the erotic, let's say, or the darkness of the erotic is how willing are people to be with everything that is? And how willing are people to feel things that they don't want to feel? And then based on that, I make decisions as to how I work with somebody. And you said before that you just alluded to it. I was wondering if you wanted to unpack it a little bit was around, you said you prefer people who actually aren't doing these heavy duty spiritual practices, but are just living this kind of openness. And I'm curious, do you mean like a kind of just open vulnerability to life, just an energetic intimacy with basic human experience? Is that what you mean? And what's Mm -hmm. the difference between, does it take practice to get there? And at the same time, practice can block you from getting there. Yeah, well, that's a whole can of worms that we can open. And (laughs) I don't think we need to go far deep into it. But David Data, of course, has a very specific body of work where he talks about function, flow and glow. And the difference between therapy, yoga or art and spiritual practice. And I remember when I first started hearing him talk about this, I very strongly disagreed because I, like most people, thought that spiritual practice was going to get me somewhere. And over the years of working and teaching with David, I've really realized that spiritual practice or spiritual experience is spontaneous when you recognize what is. So there is really nothing you need to do to have an awakened moment. You know, you're either awakened or you're not. And as time goes by, certain people become more stably awakened and Certain people just have state experiences of awakening, but the experience of being awakened doesn't necessarily come with practice. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't 
become more stable, like you said, in your ego structure, have some therapeutic Mm -hmm. pieces in place so that you're able to maintain awareness and that you're able to maintain sanity in the midst of utter insanity, right? Because life's pretty insane. And then, of course, in the art yoga realm, you stretch yourself and you stretch your body, mind, and you stretch your ability to be with things and make your vessel bigger, so to speak, make your container greater so you can hold more of both the light and the dark. But that said, you know, we talked about this before we started the interview. I had to go and identify my closest friend at the coroner this last week. And the act of going there in the middle of absolutely nowhere in deserts of California, in a place that I would consider the armpit mm-hmm. of California, uh, meeting a man who was a deputy coroner, who I can guarantee you had never done a day of spiritual practice, probably never meditate or done a workshop mm-hmm. or done any form of meditation retreat. And that man was the most open and both open as a heart being, you know, just a wide open heart, a generous, generous spirit, no flinch whatsoever, no contraction, no impatience. His body was wide open. The guy wasn't in great shape or anything. It was just everything about this man said that this was a man who worked with death every day, worked with nothing Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. half decomposed bodies with the tragicness and the suddenness of people being found, people being killed. I mean, when you're a coroner, you don't see pretty deaths. You know, you see what's left and you deal with family in a very bereaved state. And that man was so open and so wide and so deep and so stably awake without any air about him. There was nothing about this guy that says, yeah, I'm a hot shit practitioner. Uh, (laughs) Nothing. But at the same time, I don't think I've ever quite felt a being that stably with me ever. Interesting. I mean, this is very interesting because, I mean, death as a practice. A lot of my biggest energetic openings have been through close people in my life dying. And it's interesting, too, because, I mean, Freud was famous for saying that the Eros impulse was inherently connected with this drive toward death, or it was called Thanatos. And I'm curious, I mean, there's been lots of ideas about what Thanatos means, and there's been lots of psychological theories, but I'm just curious, I'm totally just intuitively feeling this out in the moment, but is there some sense that as we're developing through Eros, Eros is that movement upward and this drive toward life, that there's some kind of intuitive knowing that we want to actually be connected with death to stay grounded or to stay open, as you will, or vulnerable, that there's actually some inherent wisdom even in that Thanatos drive. I don't know if you've thought about that. Well, I would definitely say I've had many intellectual notions mm-hmm. of that, but In the last week or so, I've also gotten a very strong bodily sensation of that and strong felt experience that essentially there is no greater teacher for the spontaneous realization of what is or for the awakening than death because it becomes very, very clear that there is nothing but the present moment and that everything we do, including myself, I mean, I spend a lot of time... You can hear my roosters in the Uh, background. Michaela Michaela lives on a farm, so (laughs) I like it. (laughs) You just had a few things to say about death as well. Hmm. So that moment of realizing that every given moment in time is the last moment and that what we assume is a continuation of our life is really just an illusion because It could happen any moment. You don't know when it's happening for the most part. Most people don't know when it's happening. And all that spiritual work, just poof. (laughs) Yeah, all that spiritual work, all the calendars, all the plans, all the the amazing mapping out of what's next is totally useless in that particular moment. And all that's left is you're gone. And that, as tragic and as gut-wrenching it is, is also incredibly freeing on a very deep, visceral level because yes. there is nothing but what is. And Well, there's a fearless quality that can come out of it if you really let your heart break open to it. Exactly. Well, there's a total surrender. And, you know, the surrender is one to whatever is, is, and that's all there is. And particularly with death, 
to me, and it's always been like that in my practice, but, you know, once again, it's very different when you lose somebody that close to you that quickly, where you really can feel that, particularly with death, there is no arguing, right? There is no coping, because a lot of our lives, particularly, I think, Western lives, and particularly now, is pretty much geared towards preventing bad outcomes, right? We meditate so that our minds are quieter. We do yoga so our bodies are more supple. We take supplements. We take mm-hmm. hormones. We, I mean, we're, we're doing everything we can to prolong life, and that's all very good. And I think that needs to be done in the life-affirming realm of things. But really, you know, it makes no difference. When you're going, you're going. And the surrender into there being no arguing with death and there being no bargaining with death is incredibly freeing, at least to my heart, because there's nothing that needs to be done. And so the inherent relaxation into death is what allows people, and you know, I'm saying people, but of course allows me to be a lot more in life. Yeah. And so the striving towards death and the feeling of death is incredibly life-affirming. And that's been written about in many, many different ways. Yet the felt experience of that makes for a whole other felt dimension. And, you know, there's lots of lore. I grew up in Austria, and in Austria, one of the things that's done still consistently, and I think in many European countries, and you'll probably see this in Russia as well, is that when people die, a lot more people die at home than in America, where everything, you know, gets pushed away so that people don't have to deal with death. People die in hospice and not at home. People die in life support and not surrounded by their family. But in Austria, where that's still very much part of the tradition, typically somebody's dead body will just be put into the living room and then everybody comes and visits and you get to see dead people and you get to be with death. And the joke, of course, is always that there is lots of sex after funerals at funeral parties. And there's a reason for that, because death and sex go together, right? There's nothing more deeply affirming than having sex after having felt death. And furthermore, the evolutionary impulse in a human being, in any mammal, as a matter of fact, the evolutionary impulse in every male species of mammals is to have sex when death is impending because that is what grants the maximum dissemination of your DNA. And there's a big difference, and this brings us into polarity, sexual polarity in the realm of sex and death. The males of any species, when there is signs of impending death, starvation, war, the males of the species want to have sex because, of course, the more sex you have, the better your chance that your DNA gets put forward. So, hence, the masculine, the masculine in all of us, but the masculine in a man, if he's mm-hmm. predominantly or more masculine mm-hmm. than feminine, wants to have sex when confronted with death or feeling impending death or stress. And hence, there's a strong impulse of sex that comes with death. Interestingly enough, the female of each mammalian species is built differently because what makes the female grant survival to the offspring is not the act of sex so much, but the act of maintaining pregnancy, breastfeeding, ovulation, and child rearing. So when females of a species and when the feminine in a human being gets under stress, we tend to eat. Hmm. Because eating carb-rich foods in the cave days meant you got some berries or things like that. There were no Twinkies or whatever people eat these days or Hagen does. So you had to eat lots and lots and lots of carb-rich foods so that you could maintain ovulation, pregnancy, breastfeeding. So there's a different impulse in the feeling of death in the feminine and in the masculine. And I was curious too, I mean, you touched on how the erotic or the eros impulse arises out of or in relationship to this polarity with death and thanatos. Mm. I was thinking in my own life how much my most erotic poetry has come through confrontations with death. Mm -hmm. It feels very connected for me as well, even through my creativity. I'm curious when you're working with people, because obviously these darker energies that we're talking about, they aren't, like, we don't want to be naive about that they're just easy to 
step into and integrate. I think especially because as a culture, we don't really support people in knowing how to work with the full spectrum of our energetic experience mm -hmm. and the society's energetic experience. So there's a way that because we aren't really fluid as a culture in, you know, I mean, I'm speaking of North America, I shouldn't generalize to all cultures, but we're not really fluid with that full energetic spectrum that these energies tend to come out in ways that are I often say the culture usually either demonizes or pathologizes or fetishizes, you know, or commercializes these darker energies because they're not dealt with consciously. Mm -hmm. And so they end up coming out in some form anyway, because you can't get rid of them. But they come out in these ways that are maybe less conscious. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you see that showing up either with the people you work with or how you bring people through working with these darker energies when they really, we aren't trained by our culture how to do that? Mm -hmm. You are right, they're hard to integrate because there's no actual support for that integration or not a lot of support for that integration. And I think particularly in the spiritual communities, you know, I'm always laughing and chuckling when I see yet another irate blog post somebody writes about some spiritual teacher having had sex with his students or done drugs or, you know, I don't know what. And the reason I'm laughing is, yeah, but of course, right? And the but of course is when you cut yourself off from your darker impulses, and when I'm saying darker, I don't mean bad, but lower in the lower thicker vibrations of the energetic field and in the lower part of your body when you cut yourself off these pieces and when you don't integrate them they become very kinked and so a person's need for let's say with women this often happens i mean i'm so fascinated by everybody reading this book such an odd book to have such great success what was it called 50, 50 shades, shades of gray <laughs> and it's like really but the answer is yes really because most women right i'm saying women but i mean most mm -hmm. feminine creatures are starving for some actual penetration for mm -hmm. some full-bodied heart-centered depth of the full spectrum that a man can bring and because mm -hmm. that's not provided and also because in a certain way that's no longer politically correct to be wanted you know for us to want mm -hmm. it becomes mm -hmm. kink now we're fantasizing about some dude spanking us after work and it's not about the spanking for most women i mean that's nice and good and you know i'm not a, i mean <laughs> spank away I'm not saying i wouldn't <laughs> spank away i mean you know, but it's not the spanking it's somebody taking control it's somebody giving a strong container it's somebody pressing deeper than we can open ourselves it's somebody just heartfully mindfully bodyfully penetrating us into a place of surrender and when that's not acknowledged and when that's not given it becomes kinked and yes then you have s and m and you have whatever it is that people are into and porn and you can and porn, yeah, because porn is people's deepest desires, kink and kind of mechanized in a certain thing. So you can tell what people are into by what the porn industry is bringing, but it lacks the heart, it lacks the consciousness, the it lacks the depth, yeah. the intimacy, the desire, the heart yearning that we strive for, right? But the same the other way around. I mean, men want, man meaning once again, the masculine in a man, want to penetrate they want to conquer they want to create strong boundaries they want to have purpose but that's no longer so okay so now we have rape fantasies and guys who have a dungeon and men who have things with little boys and you know all those things that we see and then get all bent out of shape about right or you know big yeah. big yoga teachers having sex with their students well yeah because the power dynamics have to work themselves out. And if people are not taught to yeah. fill their body and their energetic being with the proper breath, heart, energetic openness, they'll do weird things. And that's the unfortunate thing. I mean, there's so many surface symptoms in the culture we can look at. I certainly researched a ton of it myself in my own writing. And there's a ton of things we can look at the culture where the kinks are showing up. And yet the interesting piece for me is increasingly like, what is the underlying cause? Like what's the boil that needs to be popped around this too? You know, not just the symptoms. And I think a lot of it has to do with the lack of artistic bandwidth we have to really engage mm -hmm. the full spectrum of our erotic energy. And again, 
you know, it's, it's difficult because there aren't a lot of role models or guidance with that. You know, I, I feel like I've just naturally been a pretty sensitive, energetic person, and I haven't I felt that I've had a lot of guidance around that in my life. And it would get kinked in different ways, you know, because I didn't have a lot of containers for it. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that the culture, we just haven't really created the support for people to know how mm -hmm. to even work with these energies. And so, yeah, not just focusing on the symptoms, but what's, what's the deeper yogic move we can do, the healing move around this, which I'm really interested mm -hmm. to explore more. Yeah. Well, you know, I make a very strong distinction between healing slash therapeutic work and yogic slash mm -hmm. artistic work. And I think those two barely ever meet. And so I think for most people going into the, you know, calling them darker or redder or juicier, but also death realms requires certain aspects to be in place and the first and foremost aspect that needs to be considered is the healing therapeutic aspect meaning if you've been violated as a child if you've had trauma both physical or sexual or emotional if you were raised to not consider certain aspects of life and that there was shame attached to it from a religious or moral standpoint you are going to need some therapy and you're going to need some repair of your body, mind, of your psyche so that you are able to embrace those aspects. Yeah. And that's true for many people, not all people, but many people that we have to repair certain things, you know, sexual shame and artistic development that was thwarted and all of those kind of things do need to be addressed. And that's where a good therapist comes in as a basis of diving in, into the deeper realms. And I would certainly not suggest that people enter what we call the darker realms without having taken that into account. And I think you did a fantastic interview with Robert Masters, who is really, really amazing in that domain and has a very deep understanding of how these things work. That to me is the basics. Um, I personally don't concern myself with those basics or only as it is apparent when I work with somebody because there's people who are specifically dedicated and trained to that. My realm is more the artistic yogic realm. And so in the artistic yogic realm, what we are looking into is more the ability of the individual to stretch or grow into a fuller, more integrated, more more capacity-holding being. And so regardless of if you had trauma or not, once your, you know, your basic psychological needs are cared for and addressed, then the question is, are you going to let your personal constriction stand in the way of your deepest freedom or your widest expression? And when you are dedicated to creating the widest possible container and the deepest possible expression, then you can yogically or artistically stretch yourself. So what that would mean is that, let's just say you're very afraid of death, you gently, but not too gently, yeah, but gradually lean into death so you would actually expose yourself to death practices to being with death or dark sexual practices or even just deeper breathing you know most people don't breathe that deeply because when you do it stirs up the lower parts of the body where all the pain and desire and dark stuff sits so you'll start bending and pressing and stretching into your constrictions and through practice, you loosen those constrictions and you become a wider and deeper human being. And so you can do that regardless of your psychological makeup because you just assume that in the stretching, you will ever so often get hurt or stretched a little bit too far, like in a good workout. When you are on an Olympic team, you are not training to not get hurt. You essentially train as hard as you can. Ever so often you get hurt, you heal as you may and you continue you know so you're constantly pressing stretching pushing right. into a deeper level and so in that particular realm you can willingly and you know consciously put yourself into realms of deeper practice and so in those realms of deeper practice you then yogically deepen a lot more into whatever is next that's not the same as therapeutic work 
I'm curious because I've heard Data talk about this also, that there is this distinction between the therapeutic, yogic, and spiritual. And I can definitely see that the integrity of their distinction. And Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering if, do you see them also bleeding into each other in certain ways? Like I was just thinking of my own experience that as soon as certain foundational things were healed more and put into place a bit better, there was a secure foundation. I Mm -hmm. found that some of those potentials that had always been there, but had been all struggling because of the foundation being shaky, started to just blossom more naturally. So there was a way that I felt they were connected in that way that building that foundation allowed for a flowering very easily of those other places. Oh, yeah. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, David always in workshops gives this example, which makes it very clear. If you've broken your leg, that's a therapeutic issue, Mm -hmm. right? You have to go and get your leg fixed. You need a cast. You need the physical therapy. If you are an Olympic runner and you broke your leg, you need to do physical therapy first. But once your leg's healed, it might be healed somewhat crooked or your muscles might not function as well as they have. Then you can artistically or yogically continue to train for the running. You just adjust your step, you adjust your training, you push into that injury into the next layer. So yes, the leg needs to be healed first. And then when you have that foundation of a solid bone and the muscles being properly attached, then you artistically do what you can do. I mean, there's, you know, there's many examples of people who were injured and are missing limbs and both emotionally and physically who are doing great art, great sport, great performance. So If people would only want to do great performance when they are perfectly whole and healed, we wouldn't have art. I mean, most art is actually born out of a kink. Yeah. Extremes too, yeah. Extremes. And and that's the thing that in my work is the driving force is that I actually think that most beautiful art and the sublime offerings come from a place of people having been injured, they having been darkness, they having been horrendous things happening and they stretched through them and in the feeling of the total darkness also felt more light than they've ever had and that's what makes great art yeah definitely and it's interesting too because you know one of the pieces i I mean i don't know if this is going to tie in with our conversation totally but (laughs) (laughs) i was just thinking about how one of the things i really noticed that can happen in spiritual circles or communities is i feel a lot of energy of people wanting to almost push something to happen. There's a kind of pushing quality or a holding quality. And I've just found that so much of my own growth through these different areas has been through falling and through, like we were saying, the healing processes, descent into the liminal where I wasn't trying to force or push anything. And then it was like in that, Mm -hmm. then things just flowered really naturally. I mean, and and it's a very authentic vulnerability. It's Mm -hmm. not like, I mean, you even sometimes meet spiritual people who are trying to be vulnerable so it still feels controlled somehow Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well you know this ties back to what we talked about earlier with death being the great moment of realizing how precious life is i think that for me the relaxation of the body particularly in women i'm not saying this is not so for men but because of how women are energetically built and the reproductive functions and how the inside of a woman's body is built, the more you push, the tighter you're going to get. And the tighter you're going to get, the less you're going to feel, the less you're capable of feeling those spaces Mm -hmm. in between space. And the less your intuition is activated, the more headspace and the more intellect you're engaging the more energy has to go up your body and you know most women these days suffer from headaches neck aches tight shoulders all of those kind of things you know lots of female diseases all of that to me hangs together with the push with the doing 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 versus being which is you know natural because of the way we live and what we need to do and i need to spend lots of my day in the doing space yet the being space and this brings us back to why are 50 shades of gray so popular is that deep knowledge that the letting go the surrender the being mm. forced to let go is what opens the body and with that opens the body mind to a much deeper expression and a much fuller recognizing of what really is mm-hmm. and so yes 
I think falling is where it's at. And I found, too, an increasing, as I'm able to, because I'm a very intellectually oriented person in general, but I found that the more I surrender into those liminal spaces and really that letting go of the mind at a very deep level, that intuition starts to inform my intellect more. I'm not letting go. I'm not losing my intellect. It's not a dichotomy. It's really that it just becomes extremely flexible and I think is infused with more humility and more connections intuitively that I could never have by just thinking Mm -hmm. in in Mm -hmm. a kind of like stuck pushing way. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think once again, when we talk about the lower parts of the body, the darker colors of the spectrum, the solar plexus and the area that in martial arts is called Hara or Dantian is a power center in the body. And there's, uh, in the yogic realms, they say there's 72,000 nerve endings. I don't know how many there really are, but it is like a second brain and yeah. it's an intuitive brain. And yes, your intellect comes in handy because you can learn how to filter what you're yes. feeling yes. and classify it and detail it into good distinction. So to me, distinction is having constant additional knowledge added to my knowledge base that allow me to distinguish what I'm feeling and make sense of it. So the intellect is incredibly important, but the intellect is not where it's received, it's where it's filtered. That's a good point. You know, and so when, when I work with women in women's groups, often we work very specifically on loosening the core of a woman's body so that the gut intuition gets activated. And furthermore, I make a very specific distinction between third eye intuition and solar plexus or gut intuition. Hmm. And for me, the gut intuition is the feeling of what's actually happening in that moment. So it's a present moment intuition, while the third eye intuition is more a potential Hmm. intuition, that which could be that which is the highest potential. So Hmm. when people are very much in the higher realms of spiritual practice, their third eye intuition is usually very well developed, but their gut intuition is not. And so there's a gap there between what's really happening and what's projected to be possible. And particularly, once again, in women, we tend to fall in love with a man's potential, uh, not with what really is. And that comes from an overemphasizing of the upper triangle of chakras versus the lower triangle of chakras, where you're not willing to feel what is, but you're willing to feel what could be. Interesting. And I mean, it's interesting you say that because, I mean, I've I've known and met so many visionary type people that are just amazing in so many ways, brilliant and really deep visionaries, like intuitively, but always the sense of kind of a lack of foundation. And usually there's a sense of disconnect that ends up happening. And the vision can't really hold in the real world if it's not connected with that deep gut. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So one last thing I want to touch on was when we think about if we want to start engaging with these darker energies, you gave some good practices with going into the body and starting to work with the body. Actually, the last talk I did with Margie Gillis, the professional dancer, we did the dark side of art. And we were talking a lot about how important the somatic stability is for holding a a lot of these energies. And so the more flexible and open you are somatically, the more capacity you have for really engaging these darker sides Mm -hmm. and moving them through you and not getting stuck in them. And I was curious if as we choose individually to engage these parts of ourselves, Mm -hmm. do you notice that people also, there's also a way that we start to take on the collective? Because if we're choosing to descend into those areas, we're also engaging areas of the culture that are being held back or repressed or not engaged fully. And so do you find people can sometimes get overwhelmed by things that are beyond just personal, collective dark energies that aren't being dealt with in the culture? Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, I would say that probably 99% of everything you see on TV is related to what people are not confronting personally. So because they're sexing, and when I'm saying sexing, I'm not, like I said, not only talking intercourse, but their relationship with the other pole and their desires sexually and where they go or don't go 
are so restricted, they need it other ways. And so you have, you know, people are just fascinated by death and rape and murder and gore. Yeah. And, Quentin Tarantino. And when, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and even just news, you know, I mean, who needs to see these things? Mm -hmm. Well, only people who are missing those spices in their everyday life, because they're really only a spice. It's not where you want to live. Yeah. You know, most people would prefer a little bit of dark ravishment in their sex life ever so often, not daily, but they don't get it. So it's like a craving for sugar or up. salt, right? It builds up. And so I would definitely say that almost everything you see, all the things that are popular on TV are the collective need for a certain nourishment and ice and ingredients that people don't get and don't get heartfully and artfully so it comes out in these odd kinked ways where nobody knows why they have to read some story about somebody being dismembered right and then that to me is a sign that something's not happening in their own life and something's not being addressed so it, it comes out in these sideways ways and so Margie, you know, is absolutely right. It's in the somatic and the way I experienced is a, essentially the container and each human has a different kind of container. If you really have just a shot glass container, so the size of a shot glass, you can't handle much. And so it doesn't matter if the entirety of existence is available to you, you can only hold a shot glass full. And so mm -hmm. you want to make your body mind a bigger and bigger vessel so that you have a bucket, then you have a pool, then you are the ocean eventually. So you, you have a much, much bigger capacity to hold things than just your little shot glass full. And so, yes, it all starts in the body and it all starts in the practices of opening your body mind into the biggest possible vessel that you want to be. And thinking of just bringing to a close of everything we've been talking about, is there any specific practices or engagements that you could offer to people listening? Because it, it's, it is such a broad topic we've been discussing. And it's interesting, as we've been talking, I've been feeling a bit of sadness just in the kind of enormity of it and the amount of suffering that is going on. And so there is this desire for me to feel into how can I even start to become, you know, we've talked about it a bit, like opening our bodies more and becoming those vessels. But is there anything else you wanted to add just for how people can start to engage us in a conscious way in their own lives, whether it's their sex lives or their practice or just everyday life? Any practical things you wanted to offer? I think what you just said is very true, right? The enormity and the depth of what we were just talking about, it's a heartbreak, you know. It's an ongoing broken heart because to the best of our ability, there's only so much we can do and so much we can feel and so much we can contribute and also take in. So I think, you know, to me personally, what I would call my spiritual practice or my life practice is the continuation of feeling my broken heart in a certain way and the ongoing breaking of my heart in the face of everything there is in people and in their suffering. And I'm pretty cynical as it is. I mean, I'm Austrian. Cynicism is an art form, right? You're not Austrian if you're not deeply cynical, but <laughs> my cynicism often is a protective mechanism against having to feel the depth of all of what we're speaking. And so for me, the I think I have a similar pattern, actually. <laughs> yeah, I think, we, you know, we, we have to somehow cope, all of us. And, you know, yeah. some people cope by meditating endlessly. Some people cope by eating. Some people cope by buying things. Some people cope by being cynical or intellectual. And I think that's all fine, right? That's all also God. You know, there's nothing that isn't God in that realm. And at the same time, you know, if there's one thing that always makes a difference and that's very basic, it's just fuller breath, just breathing deeper down into your belly, allowing your belly to actually be stretched by breath, allowing your solar plexus to be expanded by breath, allowing your lungs to be penetrated by breath. And so that the whole front surface of your body, the whole soft, vulnerable areas of the body actually get 
enlivened and activated and stretched and in that practice alone you know anytime you look at something that scares you or freaks you out if you could just breathe it in or take a breath or enliven the breath that in itself allows for greater capacity and that's always easy particularly in the realms of grief and death darker things breath in a human body is the single most important thing Mm -hmm. yeah well i'd love to continue the conversation at deepen in layers i feel like we've opened Mm -hmm. a lot and yeah i just really appreciate you coming and i know it's been an intense time for you right now and just i did want to just say for the listeners that a friend of ours james bay died this past month and you were extremely close with him and i just like to dedicate this call to him and have him be present yeah, thank you for that. I mean, to me, pretty much lost my creative other half and closest friend. And the diving into the depth of what that means in death, in life, in my teaching, in the things that we've worked on definitely inspired this call. And I'm absolutely dedicating this to James in his liminal space, wherever he is right now. <laughs> he is in the liminal. <laughs> Definitely, yes. So thank you very much. Yeah. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this in the time you're in. So it, it means a lot to me. I yeah. It. Well, what better time, right? Yeah, than really, now. Really? <laughs> we might as well live our talk, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. So yeah, thank well, you. Lots of love to you and just stay connected. Thank you. Same here. Okay. Oh no